Hi, I'm Micah Halpern. Thank you for joining me today as I do some thinking out loud. Our first segment is called Background Briefing. The first thing I've been thinking about is Jewish pride, the outward expression of Jewish pride in the United States. As all of you know, I am an unabashedly proud Jew. I do not hide the fact that I am Jewish. In fact, I announce it. Anyone can see within 100 feet that I'm Jewish because I wear a kippah in public. My kippah is not the size of a poker chip. My kippah sits comfortably on my entire head. You can even see it from the front, even though it's on the back. I announce my Jewishness with pride. Not everyone is like me, and I understand that. I'm saddened to admit that many in the Jewish community believe they should hide their Jewishness. They posit that being obvious about their Jewishness will endanger them. To be clear, I'm not just unabashedly proud as a Jew, I'm also an obvious Jew. Of course, there are risks when one dresses Jewishly in this era of heightened Jew hatred. Jews have become targets while simply walking down a street in Manhattan or riding the subway. However, that has been the case for a very long time, certainly for as long as I can remember. My kippah sometimes elicits sneers, snide comments, and even some hateful remarks. But in my experience, there are many more compliments and praise than evil, vituperative, vile, angry attacks at me as a Jew and as a lover of Israel. Make no mistake, both welcome blessings as well as unwelcome curses are directly addressed to me as an obvious Jew who loves Israel. Both friend and foe immediately conclude my marriage of Jewishness and the love of Israel. They do that naturally. There are many Jews in the United States who quake in fear. They think that if they downplay their Jewishness, the Jew hatred will dissipate, that if Israel acted differently, life would be easier for Jews in the, in the diaspora, especially in the United States. These Jews are so very wrong. This current wave of hatred towards the Jew doesn't need a reason. Israel did not cause the hatred. Public, obvious Jewish-looking Jews like myself did not cause this hatred. This current wave of Jew hatred is visceral, deep, deeply ingrained. Blaming the victim, in this case the Jew and Israel, for hatred against it is backwards. Jews that are obviously Jewish in the diaspora are united together with Israel. There might be some disagreement about this policy or that, but these same Jewish Jews in the diaspora want Israel to succeed, not simply exist. Survival and existence are not benchmark measurements of success for Jews in Israel. For Jewish Jews in the diaspora, Israel is a mecca of creativity. For Jewish Jews in the diaspora, Israel is the heart and soul of Jewish life. As fulfilling as Jewish life is in New York City, part of that creativity and fulfillment is because of and being, it's being nurtured by Israel. There is an umbilical cord connecting the communities. When Israel aches, so too does diaspora Jewry. Recently, the small synagogue or prayer hall that I frequent took down the sign outside that read in Hebrew, Beit Midrash, which means a study hall. It was not replaced. The neighbors, some Jewish and some not, were afraid the sign in Hebrew would draw attention and increase the risk to themselves and their property. Some members of the small synagogue agreed with the neighbors, and indeed the sign was taken down. The front of the brownstone was nicely painted, removing all identifying marks that it once even held a sign. I opposed the decision. They are wrong to cower in fear or to think that we can control the hatred against Jews. On April 1st, 1933, the Nazi government required all Jews and Jewish businesses, actually, to brandish a yellow badge, a yellow star, a yellow sign. On April 4th, the largest circulation Jewish-German periodical, the Yiddish Shobun Nitschau, ran an article by Robert Welch. The periodical was the arm of the German Zionist organization, and Welch was the editor. The title was, Wear the Yellow Badge with Pride. He wrote, Today the Jews cannot speak except as Jews, 
Anything else is utterly senseless. That's the quote. He concludes his essay writing that in the, quote, signs and inscriptions, one often saw windows bearing the large Magen David, the shield of David the king. It was intended as dishonor. Jews take it up, the shield of David, and wear it with pride. That's how he ends, wear it with pride. We're not living in Germany, 1933. There's no parallel. That said, we should not be ashamed or fearful. Jewish history is chock full of exciting epics and so many creative communities. It is also peppered with tyrants and places that were inhospitable to Jews. And yet Jewish communities continued to be creative and soared to great heights. Today, especially because of Israel, that rubric is still in place. And Israel helps sustain communities, Jewish communities, that are under threat. Because just as Jewish communities feel Israel's pain, Israel feels the pain of diaspora communities. Coming up next, points of view. First up is a column from Ynet. It was written by Smadar Perry and was published on November 10th, 2024. It's entitled, This is what the pogrom looks like. This is the new anti-Semitism. Subtitled, in classic Ynet form, Opinion, the outrageous anti-Semitic attack in Amsterdam was meticulously planned by Muslim population beforehand, which Dutch officials and police ignored. Perry is their Arab correspondent, and she is exceptionally insightful. This column is shocking because it shows just how organized the attacks on Israeli soccer fans in Amsterdam were. This is how Smadar Perry begins. This is what an Israeli woman who arrived in Amsterdam two days before the soccer match between Maccabi Tel Aviv and Ajax clubs wrote about the atmosphere in the city. We didn't know that the organized violent reaction from the other side, meaning the Muslims against us, was coming. Perry continues to quote an eyewitness who describes what happened minute by minute, detail by detail. It is shocking, she writes. Then, as they left the station, we suddenly heard explosions of very loud firecrackers, and many Maccabi Tel Aviv fans started running. Amsterdam Police Chief Peter Hola condemned the attack on the Israelis two days later, clarifying that the Israelis started the riots. Now Perry tells us about her argument with a friend, also in Amsterdam. The friend refuses to believe that Jews were attacked, rather that the Jews started it. She writes, A bitter and intense argument rose last Friday between me and my Palestinian friend, Tagrid al Qadouri an Amsterdam resident who worked as a New York Times correspondent in Gaza. She maintains daily contact with her family in the Strip and is a point of contact for any Palestinian or Arab VIP arriving in Amsterdam. She refused to accept that the Israelis were attacked. We had a heated debate. I quoted the King of the Netherlands, ministers and senior officials, who insisted on proving that the Arab pogrom against Maccabi Tel Aviv fans were planned ahead of time. Perry now tells exactly how the attackers found the Jews and what they did. She writes, Indeed, all indications suggest that the hunt for Israelis in Amsterdam was meticulously planned. Initial investigations revealed that the attackers created a special WhatsApp group to organize the, quote, burning revenge, unquote, for the war in Gaza. Israelis who were beaten reported that blows were accompanied by shouts of free Palestine. You're getting this because of Gaza. The attackers didn't hesitate to post photos on social media, proudly announcing how they dealt with the Israelis as they deserved. One message circulated in an Arab WhatsApp group titled, Hunt the Israelis, explicitly read, Palestinian flags must be hung around the city so they come out like mice and will pounce on them. The soccer match itself was peaceful. Arab fans were denied entry, and the planned chaos erupted right after as Israeli fans left on trams, buses, and taxis driven by Arabs towards their hotels. The attackers insisted on conveying the message that, quote, among the Israelis are soldiers from Gaza who received compensation and need to be hunted down and dealt with, unquote. 
Perry now tells us that the police arrested people and continue to arrest people as more footage posted on social media is seen and investigated. Every single person arrested, she writes, is from an Arab country. She explains, Dutch police publish photos of the detainees, all without exception from Arab countries. This is what the program looks like. This is the new anti-Semitism. It's surprising to realize time and again that Muslims, mostly from Sunni branch, generally considered more moderate within Islam, constitute the second largest religious group in the Netherlands. Perry now winds down by giving us the population stats of the Netherlands, that Muslims have created a very nice community there. She writes, out of the 17.1 million Dutch citizens, Muslims make up 6% of the population, about 1 million people. The majority, 149,000, reside in the capital itself, Amsterdam. Dutch government officials stress religious freedom. For example, 29,800 Jews also live in the Netherlands, mostly in Amsterdam also. Muslims have their own schools, mosques, halal butcher shops, which is the equivalent of Jewish kosher, and clothing stores tailored to women. Perry now concludes writing that the Netherlands was a popular destination for Israelis. That is going to end. She writes, Amsterdam was known as a popular destination for Israeli tourists until this incident. Now estimates are already saying that what happened won't be forgotten and Israelis will be reluctant to travel to the Netherlands in the near future. Smidar Perry, thank you so much for your insight. This was detail we did not get anywhere else. Next up is a column from the Jerusalem Post, and it was written by Jonathan Feldstein. It was published on November 16, 2024. It's entitled, Kudos to Huckabee, It's Time for a Christian Ambassador to Israel. Subtitled, It's Time for the U.S. to Appoint a Christian American Ambassador to Israel. Mike Huckabee is an outstanding choice, and I look forward to hosting him at my home for the Sabbath. Feldstein begins. Initially, this was written to be provocative, to change the paradigm, and to propose a new model that had the ability to serve the interests of both the United States and Israel, not in conflict, but in friendship and harmony. Just before press time, it was announced that former Arkansas Governor Mike Huckabee is being tapped by President-elect Donald Trump to serve as the U.S. Ambassador to Israel, checking all the boxes of what's been proposed below. Now Feldstein gets to his main point. For those who do not know, thus far Feldstein did this. He cleared his throat. For those of us that professionally write columns, and for that matter write seriously anything, clearing your throat is a waste of everyone's time, including the reader, including the writer. They are amateurs, they often think that they're cute, but it's not. But this is how Feldstein continues. Huckabee is an excellent choice, and we all should wish him lots of success. In the late 1980s, armed with liberal arts degree and with no particular experience or specialty beyond Middle Eastern studies, I applied for several entry-level positions with U.S. federal agencies that could lead to a career. In one job interview, my loyalty as an American was tested when I was asked, in case of a war between Israel and the U.S., which country would you support? I was thrown by the question, which raised the ageless canard of Jews having dual loyalty. This accusation is unique because it predates the State of Israel. With a handful of exceptions, particularly at the time of war, it is leveled uniquely at Jews under any circumstance. My answer to the interviewer was a lesson in why a war would never happen and how, for many reasons, the U.S. and Israel are and need to be essential allies. I was sure that he had never asked anyone of any other religious, ethnic, or national group that question, with the possible exception of Iranian Americans. Feldstein explains they took a different career path, but that's not the point. And yet, a few years later, the same dilemma arose for the new U.S. ambassador to Israel, Martin Indyk. Several years later, he writes, and well into my career, without being under suspicion, I was intrigued by the appointment of the first Jewish American ambassador to Israel, Martin Indyk. Born in London, became a naturalized citizen shortly before he was appointed ambassador in 1995. 
Here is where Feldstein and his column becomes very interesting because the FBI naturally suspected Indyk of issues and of dual loyalty because he was Jewish. Feldstein writes, he was the subject of a controversial FBI investigation, causing his security clearance to be temporarily stripped and leading some to say that he was being made a Jewish scapegoat for security lapses, which are not uncommon among diplomats. Since then, I've been uncomfortable with the trend of appointing American Jews as ambassador to Israel. Indyk became the first of seven Jewish ambassadors out of 20 American ambassadors to Israel since James McDonald served as the first American ambassador in 1949. Feldstein argues that Jews need to prove themselves and their loyalty to the United States, while that is not the case with a non-Jew. He writes, Accordingly, a Jewish ambassador to Israel needs to go out of his way to dispel any suspicion of dual loyalty, which may often put him in the particularly uncomfortable position to be especially harsh relating to Israel's interests. A non-Jew does not experience this. He can be a more reliable U.S. representative to Israel without every move, statement, and meeting with Israelis coming under microscopic investigation. Feldstein now describes the first U.S. ambassador to Israel, James McDonald. He was very Christian, a Christian Zionist. That is why Harry Truman appointed McDonald. Truman was also a Christian. Not only is McDonald's faith evident throughout his book, My Mission in Israel, 1948-1951, with biblical verses at the beginning of each chapter, he writes as a Christian whose faith is central. Because of that, he was a staunch advocate for Israel and provided aid to Jews throughout Europe before and during the Holocaust even. Ambassador McDonald personified the terms righteous Gentile and Christian Zionist, but he was never under scrutiny because of his faith. It is a great step that the United States will now appoint an ambassador to Israel who is a biblical Christian whose faith grounds him in the knowledge of Israel's being a realization of a prophecy, that support for Israel is an imperative individually and nationally, who is an honest, loyal American and can represent U.S. interests in Israel, even when there are differences of opinions, without allegations of being a traitor. Now Feldstein concludes using his thesis that Christian lovers of Israel, like Huckabee, will be excellent ambassadors to Israel. This is how Feldstein concludes. Christians who support Israel make up at least one-third of the U.S. population, most of whom voted for Donald Trump, and whose interests vis-a-vis Israel are shared. This would be meaningful acknowledgement of that, and a hat tip to a strong part of the base that elected Trump. As a Bible-believing Christian, and serving as the next American ambassador to Israel, Huckabee can both be a friend of Israel and a representative of U.S. interests, helping to smooth over differences as a friend and as a reliable representative of Israeli attitudes and expectations to the United States. McDonald represented that loyally and effectively. It's time for the U.S. to appoint a Christian American ambassador to Israel. Huckabee is an outstanding choice I look forward to hosting him at my home for Shabbat. Thank you, Jonathan Feldstein. This was an excellent, excellent column. Coming up, commentary through cartoons where pictures tell the story. I want to show you seven cartoons, just cartoons today, no memes, no headlines today at all. This first cartoon is entitled, Victory, Defeat, Arabs, Netanyahu, War, Win, Lose. Netanyahu has two fingers, the peace sign in the back of a Palestinian. The Palestinian has his hands up with two fingers on each hand up. In other words, peace. All over their bodies are two fingers, the peace sign. The cartoonist is telling us that it is both victory and defeat. That is why the cartoonist entitled it Victory, Defeat, Arabs, Netanyahu, War, Win, Lose. Next up is a donkey drawn wagon in Gaza piled with dead bodies. Above it are drones flying The cartoon is simply called the Gaza War. This third cartoon is entitled, Good Morning, Gaza, Lebanon, Israel, War Scene. 
Rising over the horizon is a sun, but is the image of the Statue of Liberty. Fighter jets are also arriving. The artist is telling us that a new day is emerging after the U.S. election. Fourth cartoon up is entitled Netanyahu Trump Wins War Tank Israel. Bibi in the Israeli tank looking at Gaza. Meanwhile, missiles are landing also. This fifth cartoon is the UN headquarters in Manhattan. An Israeli fighter jet just bombed the building. The cartoon is entitled Israel Bans Umrah. The jet is saying, we warn fast. The sixth cartoon is a vortex. In the center of the vortex is an Israeli fighter jet, and it's surrounded by rockets and missiles going down and down and down. The cartoon is entitled Vortex War, Israel, Gaza, Lebanon, Bombing, F-16. And finally, the seventh cartoon is entitled To End War, Peace Talks Are Required. I'm not certain that that's correct. One side can simply give up, and it's depicted in this cartoon as a huge black bomb with a tiny olive branch. In a moment, more of my own perspective and a few predictions. Pope Francis called for an investigation to determine if Israel's attacks in Gaza constitute genocide. According to excerpts released from an upcoming book ahead of the Pontiff's Jubilee year, this is the first time that Francis has openly urged for an investigation of genocide, the allegations over Israel's actions in the Gaza Strip. In September, the Pope said that Israel's attacks in Gaza and Lebanon have been immoral and disproportionate, and that its military has gone beyond the rules of war. The book will be released ahead of the Pope's 2025 Jubilee. Yemen's Houthi forces attacked a vital target in Israel's Red Sea port of Eilat with a number of drones. The Iran-aligned terror group's military spokesperson, Yahya Sari, announced the attack in a televised speech. We've been thinking out loud about a lot today. Now that you know what I've been thinking, let me know what you're thinking. Email me at micah at jbstv.org. Tweet me at Micah Halpern. Tell me what you think. Before we end, let me leave you with one picante piece of information. Did you know that Hamas has lost its mandate in Gaza? There's no question in my mind that that's the case. For a year, starting nearly immediately after October 7th, after the massacre, that took place on October 7th, after Israel began its campaign to root out Hamas, the people of Gaza, first quietly, and now more and more strongly, are shouting, even begging Israel to get rid of Hamas. Many in Gaza even celebrated Yahya Simwar's death. This is a video of interviews of Gazans that was aired on Israel's channel 12 News. The subtitles in English are translations of the complete 21-minute Arabic segment. The voiceover is a synopsis. It synopsizes five-minute version, and this is the five-minute version. These pieces are important for us to understand firsthand that Israel is not just protecting Israelis, but Gazans from Hamas. In the midst of the Gaza Strip, under the control of Hamas, a cry for help echoes from the voices of everyday Gazans. Desperate, exhausted, and fearful, these people are no longer silent. They're risking everything to speak out, to tell the world what it's like living under the grip of a government they call oppressive. And now, in a remarkable turn, many Gazans are even looking to Israel, not as an enemy, but as a potential liberator from Hamas. The original video in Arabic is 21 minutes long. The following is a translated English version. If you wish to watch the full video in Arabic to see if the translations are accurate, please find the link in the description below. The first voice that we hear said the following. May God punish Hamas. They've taken our homes. They've killed our people. We suffer every day under their rule. We can't breathe here. All the destruction, it's because of them. For years, Hamas has claimed to represent the people of Gaza, but those voices tell a different story, a story of a people held hostage in their own land, 
unable to speak freely for fear of violent retribution. The second voice we hear said the following, We can't even raise our voices against them. If we speak out, we die. This isn't resistance, this is oppression. We're just ordinary people suffering under their control, and yet anyone who dares to oppose them is silenced. The ordinary Gazans want the world to know they are not complicit in the actions of Hamas. Many are desperate for peace, desperate for the basic necessities that have been stripped from them, food, water, and freedom. These are no longer a reality for Gazans under Hamas's governance. The set third voice we hear said the following, Our homes are destroyed. Our children suffer. We don't want Hamas. We want a life where we can simply live, eat, and sleep in peace. Many Gazans, exhausted by the endless cycles of violence and poverty, have begun calling for something that, just years ago, would have seemed unthinkable. They're asking for a change, a change that might involve Israel stepping in to provide stability and order. To them, Israel, once viewed solely as a symbol of conflict, has come to represent a hope for safety and normalcy. The fourth voice we hear said the following, Israel, you're better than Hamas, we are with you, bring back order, bring back peace. It's a call that's rooted in frustration and a longing for peace that seems impossible under Hamas's rule. The people of Gaza are now openly asking, if Hamas won't protect us, who will? The fifth voice said the following, may God take them away. Hamas has done nothing but bring suffering. They claim to fight for us, but we're the ones paying the price. They don't care about us. They've only destroyed us. In a shocking twist, some Gazans now express relief at the news of the elimination of Hamas's leaders. These leaders, once celebrated by some as symbols of resistance, are now seen by many as the cause of their suffering. Sixth voice said the following, When we heard that Sinwar was gone, we cheered, Finally, maybe we'll be free. Maybe we can live a life without fear. For the people of Gaza, this isn't just about politics. It's about survival, about holding on to the hope that one day they too can experience the peace they see beyond their borders. Israelis watching, please hear us, says the seventh voice. We want our lives back. We want our children safe. We don't want Hamas anymore. We want peace with you. The voices of Gaza are louder now than they've ever been. They are voices of resilience, of a people yearning for the basic rights that most take for granted. They are voices for a future without Hamas, a future where they can breathe freely, where their children can play without fear, and where the darkness of oppression is finally lifted. This is the reality of Gaza. This is the plea of its people. It's time the world listens. As we hear these courageous voices from Gaza, the question we must ask ourselves is, what can we do to help amplify their cry for freedom? Can awareness and support from around the world bring a brighter future to those suffering in silence? If you believe in peace and the power of unity, please consider sharing this video. Show your support by hitting the like button, subscribing to our channel, and clicking thanks or join to help us continue sharing stories that need to be heard. Thank you for watching. For the people of Gaza, the truth was hard to speak because Hamas was so horrifically brutal and did not tolerate even the slightest critique. This is another example of the collapse of Hamas. Thank you for thinking out loud with me, Micah Halpern. Let's think out loud again next week on JBS.